Holiday time for Generation X was filled with all sorts of things you don't see today. Truly memorable holiday specials, kitschy Christmas songs, Christmas time is near. Last Christmas I gave you my heart. and lots of TV ads for new toys. But probably the most exciting part of holiday time was the arrival of this, department store Christmas catalogs. You've got a lot of men to buy for, but not a lot of ideas. Come to Sears. What a great gift for the holidays. Just go to J.C. Penny. This is J.C. Penny. As an 80s kid, when the first Christmas catalog arrived in the fall, I was thrilled. This was where kids saw everything toy companies had to offer each year, all in one place. I took my time poring over each page, weighing each toy's potential and imagining how I might incorporate it into the toy landscape I already had. My strategy went like this. I looked through every single page at least twice and made my list on a neat sheet of notebook paper, putting the coolest thing at the top, of course, with like five stars and hearts next to it. I also wrote a short explanation of why I wanted each thing, making sure to sound as reasonable and adult as possible to impress the parents. I also made sure to put educational and clothing options on there too, you know, to increase the odds of getting even cool practical gifts. These catalogs were a huge part of Christmas, but they are also a great snapshot of American culture year by year. You have great documentation of fashion, hair, makeup, and technology that is true to life, not the stylized versions we got even back then in the movies or on TV. This is truly amazing. A portable television studio. No wonder your president has to be an actor. He's got to look good on television. There were three main catalogs of the era, J.C. Penney, Sears, and Montgomery Ward. It was really important to look through them all because they each had different options. Sometimes there were exclusives only available at one. The prices were different as well, but as kids, we didn't care so much about that. I was curious how these three catalogs compared to each other, so I thought it would be fun to take a look at what all three had to offer from one year. I chose 1984, so let's take a look at some of the most popular toys from that year in each catalog to see how they stack up. Let's start with some toys that debuted in 1984, Transformers. Let's compare the prices in the photos of Optimus Prime, who was definitely on a lot of boys' wish lists that year. The line was still small and only takes up one page in J.C. Penney and Montgomery Ward and half a page in Sears. The Sears photo also had him transformed incorrectly. And would you like to guess who has the lowest price? It was Montgomery Ward at $20.99. Next up is Rainbow Bright, another new toy in 1984. She managed to get six full pages in Montgomery Ward and only one in Sears and J.C. Penney. Interestingly, when looking at the basic 9-inch doll, Montgomery Ward came in cheapest again. Now let's look at some toy lines that have been out for a while to see how they compare. Masters of the Universe action figures started out in 1982, so by 1984, they were well established. They had four pages in Montgomery Ward, although I will point out that lots of the offerings were not toys, but clothing and bedding. This was common in Sears catalogs too, as you can see here with the third page of Return of the Jedi merchandise. And who had the lowest price for Snake Mountain and the Imperial Shuttle? These were both fairly expensive items, and again, it was Montgomery Ward. Just out of curiosity, I looked up one of the most expensive and physically largest toys from the 1980s to see what the price was. No, I'm not talking about the USS Flag. I'm actually talking about the Strawberry Shortcake Berry Happy Home playset. It's smaller than the 1985 Flag, which came out priced at around $110. But in 1984, the Berry Happy Home was in its second year, and it was still listed at a whopping $149.99 in Montgomery Ward. It was a whole $10 cheaper at both Sears and Penny's, but that still put it way out of reach for most kids back then, including me. Even though these catalogs were a huge part of Christmas for me as a kid, I realized in writing this video that there was a lot I didn't know. So I reached out to arguably the best person possible, Robert Bowler, who was VP of Advertising at JCPenney for over 30 years, starting in 1974. He kindly answered my questions about how these books were made. You and I saw these books as toy catalogs. To me, it made sense that the toy companies were closely involved and looked at these books as a huge marketing device. While that may be somewhat true, Mr. Bowler tells me that to JCPenney, toys were not very profitable, particularly those advertised on national TV. It makes a lot of sense. On a toy that may only retail for $10 to $15, there isn't a lot of room for markup. The biggest profits for catalog producers were those Sears or Penny's exclusive toys. Since all the toys in the catalogs were not being directly marketed by the toy company, the department store actually had a buyer who went out and shopped for toys to put in the catalog. They were the ones negotiating the prices. Don't you wish that were your job? Let me put it this way. I have an extensive collection of name tags and hairnets.
Another interesting thing to note is the timeline of producing these catalogs. So many people work to produce them, it's really amazing. They're usually somewhere around 600 pages, and they had to be complete in mid-August. They started work on them in March, and the books hit the stores in mid-September. Keep in mind that cartoon season started in September as well, and a cartoon success or failure really influenced toy sales, but by then it was too late. The books were printed for better or worse. And in case you didn't know, some of these catalogs are worth a lot of money today, some of them over $50 each. So if you have some laying around, don't chuck them in the trash. Catalogs are, for the most part, a thing of the past. In my interview with Mr. Bowler, he says that the internet has definitely changed the game, and that paper catalogs are not sustainable. Montgomery Ward stopped production back in 1985, possibly because of all those low prices, and Sears quit in 1993. Pennies held out the longest, but in 2010, they threw in the towel as well. Since Michael and I don't have kids, looking through these catalogs really made me wonder, how do kids today find out about the newest toys? With almost no catalogs left and people getting rid of cable in favor of streaming, it seemed like kids must just be hearing about everything online. We asked around, and it sounds like YouTube is possibly the biggest place where kids hear about new toys. Second was good old-fashioned word of mouth. I did learn about the Toys R Us catalog, Although when I called my local store at the beginning of December to get a copy for this video, I was told the prices had expired in November, so they had all been thrown in the trash. Ugh! So parents, if you do have a modern toy catalog, do your kids a favor. When your kid is around seven or eight, take that catalog and set it aside. Years from now, they'll be thrilled to flip through the pages and remember when they thought toys were awesome. We'd love to hear about your favorite Christmas catalog memories, so tell us about them in the comments. We hope you have a great holiday season. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.